Okay, John Seal. The Mad Max movies are such classics of cinema. Can you talk about jumping on board Fury Road as the cinematographer? Uh, yes, I was um, approached by George at a very late stage of the post-production um, with only really a, a couple of months to go to shooting. Um, so it was all a bit, uh, a bit sudden, but uh, it, it, most of the pre-production had been done. I had to just sort of really uh, try and pick it up myself and, and, and work out where they were and where they were at. Uh, one of the interesting, very interesting things was that uh, George was building his own 3D cameras, uh, which uh, I blazed into. I'd never done, uh, you know, a, a digital film or a 3D film up to that point. So suddenly there I was in the middle of it, um, which is very exciting and very interesting. Um, we were doing a lot of work still on the camera for a short amount of time until suddenly George in a meeting suddenly decided to, um, to go 2D. So that uh, released us out of all of that tension of the building and the cameras and they were having technical problems as well, uh, released all of that tension and we ended up going 2D on uh, standard production cameras and it, it did, as George said, it kind of liberated us all um, to, to, to making his movie. We were able to use multiple cameras, uh, have more of them and the quality was, uh, I believe, a touch better because of the... Uh, the chip was a lot better in the camera. Uh, so all in all, it, uh, it, it improved greatly. Mm -hmm. You had been uh, out of the game for a while from what I understand. Uh, you were sort of in semi-retirement when this film came along. Uh, so what about it made you come back, you know? Uh, well, <clears throat> Zach, I've, I've retired after, after every movie for the last 15 years. <laughs> so. <laughs> When you say I was in semi-retirement, yes, I suppose I was. Um, but then I'd worked with George before on Lorenzo's Oil, years before in Pittsburgh, and enjoyed working with George completely. Uh, I found him a very interesting director visually, um, and the performances, and the story, the writing. Uh, he, he's a very, very versatile and talented man, and, and we, we got on well, I think, on that. Uh, so when uh, when he had to find another cameraman, uh, he rang me, and uh, I'd heard on the grapevine uh, the problems they were having with 3D cameras, uh, but solving them as they went along, and I, I I was keeping track of how it was going. And when he rang, it was a bit of a shock that he did, uh, because it was so late in pre-production, but one that uh, was quite easy in a way to make a decision to go with him and uh, help him make the film, and uh, I'm glad I did. Mm -hmm. well, let's talk about creating that visual style for the film, uh, because it doesn't look like, in a lot of ways, uh, some of the other Mad Max films. Uh, you know, so what were some of your initial thoughts uh, when you came on board? Zach, once again, in a way, uh, I didn't have too much in the pre-production to give towards that because it had all already been done. The film was basically in a 10 year pre-production. Mm -hmm. So all of the choreogra choreography of the stunts of the film basically had been done and was locked in. It had to be locked in because of the massive uh, stunts and for sheer safety for everybody involved, that could not be changed, not in a hurry because uh, it had all been worked out. The look of the film was uh, in abeyance. I'll, I'll, I'll put it that way. That George's knowledge of uh, computer post work, um, from, I think from his from his uh, animated films, uh, was more than enough for him to know that he could change and mould that image to whatever we wanted in post for the final image. So that the actual initial shooting of the film uh, wasn't too sort of uh, directional in any any direction that would lock us in. It gave George um, the ability with, with the DI colorist, uh, Eric Whip, um, to be able to move in any direction. I, but we used to have long talks on the set 
with uh, the still photographer's uh, computer and desaturating it or adding grain and contrast. And we'd go through all of that uh, on set, but we wouldn't let it affect our cameras in the actual shooting. But we knew that in post-production, that's the way it might head uh, if George wanted it that way. So most of it was fairly simple, except uh, for me coming in late, except for the fact that I had to really uh, work hard to work out what the storyline was. There was no real script involved. It was all storyboards, and the whole film was built and developed on storyboards. So the script, because of the lack of dialogue, was a very sparse script, and, and it didn't kind of, in a way, really tell you that much. So really, I was catching up as we were shooting um, because of that massive pre-production. Everybody else knew, but I had to try and catch up with it. Well, that's one of the things I was going to comment about is that, you know, this film, it just hits the ground running, and there's very little in the way of dialogue and exposition. So can you talk about uh, creating this exposition visually, you know? I, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's almost like a like a silent movie in parts of it. It is very much so, very much so. And uh, what I love about George's work is that he doesn't feel he needs to explain it explicitly. He allows the intelligence of the audience to to assume some, what's happened or, or to, to later work it out as, as the story unfolds, that the green place um, uh, was the tree and that the green place because of talk with the Volvilini that maybe it was the ooze that came out of the soil. And then so they can work out, hey, what was the apocalyptic event that created um, this desert wasteland? Uh, was it uh, fracking for oil and killing the ground or was it um, the pollution we're putting into the atmosphere to create global warming? What was it? We don't know, but he does leave an awful lot to the audience to, to try and work out and will who will work out what actually happened and where they where they're going to go will they solve it um so i like that i like the fact that he's leaving an awful lot of a lot of the uh, the script out to let the audience um do a lot more thinking about it but he's dropping in these lovely hints from different angles different people uh during the story to help them along the way mm -hmm. so this is a massive undertaking uh, take us on to the set. You're out in the desert. Uh, there's a lot of stunt work. You know, tell us about some of the uh, challenges that you guys faced during the making of the movie. Well, most of it, most of it, Zach, was in the cab of the truck. Forty-five percent, um, maybe a little more, of the of the film is inside the cab of a, a truck, and that that for uh, seven people when it's full with five girls and the two leads, uh, was a pretty full truck. And so we had to work through windows and wherever we could. Going 2D at the last minute was great because it gave us very small compact cameras to work with and we could get them in and hide them behind seats or under the dash or whatever. So that was good. But most of the uh, angles of George's were predetermined by the storyboards. And he was very explicit with that. He didn't, uh, the film wasn't a normal, say, what if film? What if we do it from here? What if we do it from there? Mm -hmm. um, George knew where it was from because 10 years of pre-production and storyboards told him where it was going to go and that's where his camera went. But we did add in multiple cameras where we could to get cross shooting and get cutaways in the back seat or whatever. We worked those a lot. Lighting that, uh, as well as having so many cameras was a problem. But once we went 2D, the capabilities of the 2D cameras were much greater than the 3D camera that he'd been building. And the latitude in exposure was a lot better so that I was able to use smaller compact LED lights, which fitted between cameras. They were handheld so that the um, lighting boys could actually get lights behind, uh, between cameras or behind the operator's head and um, and work them. And if the camera moved, which we had the ability to move cameras up and down, then they could move with the cameras. And, and any shadow movement on the actors would look as though it's the truck movement anyway. So we were pretty loose and free about it. Uh, 
And I think that that helped the actors a lot to just do what they want to do and not restrict them to any lighting format or camera formats. All the operators uh, and the lighting boys just just waltzed with them. So when they moved, everything else would move and it just kept the whole thing going. So that was the biggest challenge. Um, David Burr on second unit, action unit, did some extraordinary stunts which were choreographed by by uh, our stunt coordinator. And, and they were extraordinary because you know, in the long pre-production, every truck and car was choreographed for safety, but also for a spectacular stunt. And I think when you find that, uh, I would say 80% of the film, the trucks that the actors are involved in aren't moving. They're on a sim tra travel plate or um, they're on the ground and, and we're moving the cameras a little to make it look as though it's still uh, traveling. A lot of wind machines to get hair blowing in the wind uh, as though they're traveling. Uh, lighting moving, creating little shadows across the faces that moved. All of that helped to keep this uh, feeling that in fact the, the truck is moving. But for sheer safety, convenience, um, for shooting and uh, for crew and actors, they, the trucks weren't moving. So it was uh, something that George honed from the early Mad Maxes, where they kind of really invented, I think, SimTram, and and uh, and I think on Mad Max they they you know were, were polished to the uh, and honed to the to the utmost to get it right. And I think I think he did watching it again uh, yesterday. Um, certainly, I don't think there's many times there anybody would ever think the trucks aren't moving. Well, you certainly fooled me, um, <laughs> and. Uh I want to talk some more about the stunt work because it's really incredible and the majority of it is practical. Um, can you talk about the, the benefit, uh, not just from a filmmaking standpoint, but from a viewer's standpoint of doing these stunts practically um, as opposed to say on a green screen or on a computer? I think that for Guy Norris, uh, you know, coming out of uh, a traditional uh, stunt work over the years where everything was uh, real, it was live action. I think he kept that going, but also I think the um, the way they choreographed it, that often the, the truck that was being hit, or car, vehicle that was being hit, actually wasn't moving. But the, the war rig or any big truck and other vehicles would be pounding down and the cameras were moving uh, with the, the war rig, then they would hit a stationary vehicle. But in the edit, that stationary vehicle is actually moving. So the moment of the edit is a split second after it hits. So the whole inference is they caught up with a slower vehicle. They didn't bang into a static vehicle. And I thought that was all brilliantly done. It was all worked out by Guy Norris over the years. And every... Uh, every uh, stunt had a, a set dance pattern of cars, how, how they were going to move, where they'd be at a certain impact point, that everything was safe. All the stuntmen driving were safe. Um, there were a, uh, quite a bit of kind of CGI bodies and figures uh, were painted in later to be, to be t taken off the top. An enhancement of smoke, dust and flames were added uh, if they weren't substantial enough for the um, for the stunt, so th that was embellished by visual effects. But basically, uh, Guy Norris and Davy Burr shooting shooting that action unit put together some extraordinary stunts uh, of live action that were then very well embellished by visual effects to make it um, look a little more sort of uh, flame and smoke ridden than it was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other uh, striking thing about this movie is how uh, painterly a lot of these images are. Uh, so can you talk about, you know, filming action in that way? Uh, not just the action, but, I mean, all of these, you know, wonderful shots of the landscape, uh, you know, the barren landscape. Um, can you talk a bit about that? We had we had long talks. I came, as I said, I came in late on pre-production, so a lot of that talk had been done. So I, I was busy trying to catch up with all of that. But 
Basically, uh, George's interesting outlook for the film was that it is post-apocalyptic and most people, and he did, wouldn't do it. He refused to do it, and I, I love him for it, that he refused to do a standard uh, desaturated grey, blue, black kind of feeling that there was no colour left in the world. He said, I don't want to do that. And I thought, you beauty. Um, so he's moved it towards a maybe a scorched earth look, you know, that orangey yellow um Maybe whatever the apocalyptic event was put a lot of dust and haze into the air. Maybe the maybe his uh, hint of global warming has made uh, desert storms so big now, which is in the movie, so big that they actually go into the upper atmosphere and the sun shines through them and it's a yellow cast. And so there's a lot of logics in that in that colouring. And I think that uh, we didn't do too much of that in camera. Because then it's sort of locked in. Um, really, the, the feeling is that the, the, the digital intermediate now on the computer, you can add it all in later a lot safer. Take it out a little, add a bit more. Grain is the same. You can add it, subtract it. Um, so that all of that in George's mind and his great knowledge of, of uh, post-production on the computers helped to, for him to be able to shoot it very simply and therefore fast, and then get it back home on the computers and then start to, um, to embellish it with the, um, with the DI colorist, uh, Eric Whip, who did a fantastic job. And, and so he, he, he relied on that a lot. We did a lot of talking off laptops to say, what about this? Look at this. Uh, this is a lot of grain. This is less. And, and we talked uh, with George and, and, uh, and uh, the visual effects guys and uh, and also Jason Boland, our still photographer, who did great stuff on his. And, and all in all, it, it helped us all to to really try and see which way, where the film would end up. And then, of course, later in post, George was able to start to lock it down and we were able to follow that carefully and be able to then uh, make it uh, continuity all the way through the movie. There was a nice feeling of continuity. So all in all, the reliance was more on the post effect than in camera effect. Lastly, I just want to ask you, um, you know, you're such a legend in your field. You've got an Academy Award. You've worked with some great directors on some really outstanding films. What would you say to anybody who aspires to do what you do, to be a cameraman? I'd say, uh, I'd say run the other way quickly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, it's a it's a great, uh, very satisfying uh, business to be in, um, and and you know, my thanks to so many wonderful directors for asking me to help make their films um, it is so great. Uh, to get there, I'm asked all the time, how how do you get there? And I'm not too sure really what the answer is. I, I think having a love of making films, of not worrying about too much your own physical comfort, you know, because you, you get to, you have to go to far-flung corners of the earth. Your family life is shot to pieces. Um, you have to put up with all of that and be happy about it. And I think, uh, I think that's the main stay once you're in the film business and, and being asked to help make films. Uh, getting into it is another difficult uh, thing. I've I've always advocated that you uh, you need to bug people, ring them all the time, and keep asking for a job until they get so sick of you they'll give you a job to uh, to shut you up. That's how I got in, and I, that's how I tell people to do it. But once you're in there, um, no, it's just I think a love of the game and understanding maybe as much as you can of what the director wants, the actors need trying to make a good film for the editor so he could cut it well and make it a powerful film out of the editing room and then and then having a nice uh, look to it that's a reality look to that storyline at the end. I think that com uh, total combination is probably uh, the best, best I could do at this stage in suggestion. Well, thank you so much and congratulations on the film, John. Thank you, Zach, very much. Thank you. Good day. Thanks.